very good afternoon to all of you. I am Priyanshi welcoming you all on behalf of Solar Quarter and First Week to our exclusive webinar Good Week 2023. I take the pleasure to thank our panel members for extending their immense support to organize this event and a very special thanks to our exclusive partner Good Week for their immense support in organizing the event. Let me take you through today's agenda. We'll be having three presentations and a panel discussion on market analysis and solution. We also have an exciting poll with amazing gift vouchers of for $30 Amazon gift cards for the lucky winners. Do not miss this and the polls will be open for the entire session. Let me display the polls for the audience. So we have some exciting polls for the audience. Great. I can see people voting for it. Great to see such excitement. This is the second poll. And the last one. Perfect. So the polls will be available throughout the session and everybody can vote. Starting uh, today's day with opening remarks by Mr. Jail Jiang, who's the manager of Goodby Jail, Southeast Asia and Middle East Asia region. Distinguished guests, partners, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jiao Jiang, manager of Southeast and Middle Asia of Goodwe. It's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to open our Good Week APAC sessions. Good Week has become a tradition of Goodwe, an annual event where we meet with everyone in the PV industry to share information and exchange information. As you know, Photovoltaic power has grown very significantly with constant changes over the last century. The industry has grown from scratch as scientists have ex explored the secrets of light and electricity. Light has become an energy source and the efficiency of PV continues to improve. Over the past few decades, PV systems have continued to decrease in cost which made the PV move into more and more areas. Over the past years, the introduction of the dual carbon goal and the changing geopolitics landscape have made the world increasing expectation of new energy resources represented by PV. In some regions, we have seen a surge in energy peak prices and usage costs. We have been changes in politics such as net meeting, we have been subsides for energy storage in some countries, and we have been increasing requirements for energy storage configurations with PV system. That's because we've seen the increasing broad application of PV, the combination of the PV and energy storage, the combination of PV and charging, and other such as new possibilities give it more and more imagination on how we can apply the PV power. In APAC, more powerful PV products and solutions are driving the development of next generation solar system. Meanwhile, the number of PV countries experience growing in their CNI storage market and even utility scale market is also increasing faster. Bring with its a range of regulations, designing and supply chain challenges. In this event, we tried to incorporate some relevant information from extremely relevant partners in different sectors. Their lectures will give us updating information very well, updating on what is going on in the sects and what have, will be more in the sect during this year and the next ones. If you get the right information from here, you know whether you can benefit from these changes. 
What product are you looking for? What kind of the solutions meet your needs? And what kind of supply chain can help you build your solar system and projects? Of course, Goodwill will also show you how, among these possibilities, we can serve you as a one-stop energy solution provider to help you to achieve your business goals and needs. Once again, I would like to thank all of the speakers and the participants of your participation, and I wish you a good time with the information that will be re received in these lectures. Have a good day. Thank you so much for the kind words. Now proceeding with the first presentation of the day by Mr. Dharmendra Kumar from SNP Global uh, on utility scale and rooftop solar demand in Southeast Asia. Welcome on the stage, sir. Thank you, Priyanshi, and thank you, Solar Quarter. Let me so can you please share your screen? Yes, I'm doing it. Give me a second. So we are not able to hear you properly. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Please take it. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Solar Quarter, for the wonderful opportunity. And I would also like to thank all the audience and the panelists to be joining together today. And um, I'm Dharmendra Kumar from SNP Global Penang, Malaysia. I look at this solar market in Southeast Asia. APAC and also the global market. We work into various solar rooftop and uh, ground months or utility scale reports across the globe. At the same time, we also provide our, our support to all the investors, developers, EPC companies, module suppliers, inverter suppliers throughout the globe. And then uh, coming back to the topic of the day, I would be speaking about how exactly the utility scale market and the rooftop market is shaping up Southeast Asia at the moment. As I mentioned before, I belong to the SNP Global's Commodity Insights team, and we provide unparalleled data and deep insights of global energy and commodities market. We enable customers to make decisions with conviction and create long-term sustainable value. Let's, let's take a quick look at what exactly happened in 2022. We were all, everybody in the solar sector was, from past two years was uh, experiencing a kind of jolt from the COVID-19 and then that has also been seen in the 2020 installations directly. It impacted the installations as well and we saw some of the markets shown some really utmost resiliency and they continue to do their installations even though all the problems were there. Problems like some of the markets couldn't have uh, uh, labors available. Some of the markets were not able to procure their modules on time because of the module supply chain issues and also the module prices going so high that some of the markets even provided extension to their projects so that they can still continue to, to do the installation and the rest of the preparation and wait for the module prices to stable, come come to a stable level and level and then they can go ahead. So over here, you can see that we had seen uh, quite a good number of installations in Thailand in 2022, followed by Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, Singapore, Indonesia, Myanmar, and Laos. At the same time, we also saw that some of the promising markets wherein there was some very good announcement in the early 2019, we saw projects being um, announced and then the projects do, couldn't complete again because of the political situation and political uncertainties in some of the countries. In countries like Malaysia or Philippines, we are seeing that the government is really pushing towards doing more and more utility scale installations through their progressive policies. Now, what has happened in 2022 is also going to impact the forecast in 2023. We are seeing that at the moment, almost all, all of the Southeast Asian countries has very, very good and potential pro projects in hand, and they are waiting to be constricted and completed at the same time. 
in terms of utility scale as i spoke even before that philippines has already started their green energy auctions and the country has already said that they're going to um, continue the green energy auctions more often on annual basis but again it depends how how good they are at doing the auctions on year yearly basis malaysia has been doing pv auctions through lss program and they have already done until lss4 lss5 is yet to be announced and again the problem here is that we can have each year we can have um, equal number of installations going up but with um, with the political uncertainties certainties that we see here we see that the projects are getting delayed however some of the countries again has taken measures in terms of how to get their projects done on time and again because of the covid-19 impact some of the countries have also given extension for 4 to 5 years to for each project owners depending upon when the projects were awarded however we can see that some of the uh, com- countries which has just started evolving the emerging markets i must say we will be seeing much of installation coming up from there as well like cambodia laos moving on from utility scale to the um, rooftop market most of the roof mark rooftop market at the moment are happening because of the self consumption projects and also because of the net metering projects self consumption projects are mostly happening in thailand where in again they are doing thai, um self consumption projects they are also doing uh, P, private ppas and then the new market which is coming up is the virtual ppa market so we will be seeing more and more installations happening in thailand in upcoming years talking about vietnam solar market the rooftop market was really booming a couple of years back and then uh, there is a stop all of a sudden however the government is already working in this on the um, pdp plan and then the moment we have the plan out we'd be seeing the market growing once again but it depends how the uh, the government is going to uh, provide their policy support to to the pv industry in the region for cambodia will be seeing that uh, there are chances of more uh, utility scale projects coming up and these projects will be actually supplying to neighboring countries as well singapore will be seeing more and more rooftop projects coming up along with storage at the same time we'll also be seeing some floating projects coming out of singapore we have already seen few examples there in terms of indonesia we'll be seeing a mix of ground mount rooftop as well as floating solar projects they are already building one of the biggest floating floating solar project at the moment which is still under construction and got delayed as well it was supposed to get completed in 2022 because but again because of various reasons the project has been delayed and expected to complete in 2023 we'll be seeing laos as well doing some uh, ground mount projects and again not for their own usage rather they'll be you know exporting their electricity to solar electricity to neighboring countries including malaysia and singapore moving on to what is actually driving these markets we spoke about rooftop market we spoke about the ground mount market what what is it that is driving these markets in these countries if you look at if you look closely then most of these markets are being driven at the moment by the government policies wherein the government is allowing the pv developers we can see that philippines has already started their pv auction scheme the green energy auction scheme Malaysia is doing large scale solar program along with net metering and Malaysia is also doing floating pv market floating pv um, installations Thailand is mostly at the moment based on the CNI rooftop pv Singapore we are seeing rooftop as well as fpv Indonesia we are going to see more and more ground mount pv coming from there along with some large scale floating pv and then we will be seeing uh, cambodia again with the ground mount pv coming from there taking a closer look at some of the countries that we mentioned here you can see that in philippines the major uh, pv auction that has happened has happened in luzon region visayas and mindanao most of these projects are located in this in these regions itself and then we'll be seeing 
the Luzon region doing most of the PV installations because of the um, green energy auction which has happened. We'll be seeing a single project happening in Visayas region and then the Mindano region. So uh, that's how at the moment the countries in Southeast Asia is planning their um, new PV installations. Going to another example of Malaysia, wherein Malaysia is doing large scale solar installations and we can see that there is already a good scatter of projects, I would say. The projects are very nicely balanced and then you can see that the projects are being installed on time. Though some projects are still like uh, there were projects from LSS1 and some projects couldn't get their land availability on time. LSS2 projects, LSS3 projects and then we have LSS4. So uh, continuously if the projects are coming up then we will have we'll be seeing more and more ground mount installations taking place in Malaysia. But uh, if, if at all the government is not able to uh, come up with the LSS programs on year on year basis, then we'll be seeing a little bit of lag as well. However, the market is going to be around one gigawatt plus if LSS program net metering continues to be growing as fast as it's growing. Last but not the least, uh, floating PV market, which is also one of the biggest market at the moment globally. And then the major part of this floating PV market is currently governed by Southeast Asia market. As per SNP global forecast, we are forecasting around 13 to 14 gigawatt of installations happening until 2026. And then out of that top eight markets will be mainland China, Taiwan, Japan, Netherlands, Vietnam, South Korea, and Thailand, and not forget India. At the same time, we will we are also seeing that around a total of 70 markets are currently participating in floating PV projects, and they are coming to be a total of 51 gigawatt of projects. Although they are all into various stages of development at the moment, from potential to pre-planning to under construction and completed as well. In terms of top 10 FPV markets, we are seeing that uh, India, Indonesia, South Korea and mainland China, they are going to be leading the market, followed by Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Portugal, Netherlands and Greece. So that is a total of 11 gigawatt market, which is currently being held globally. And out of that, we are seeing that the major four or five markets are again from Asia. The only uh, uh, major driver again for the floating PV market is the lack of land availability in Southeast Asia because most of the part is covered by water. So with that, I think Southeast Asia can always leverage this market and do more and more installations because you don't need land for this. And at the same time, you have water availability, water surface availability, which is not going to cost you anything. However, the government needs to provide policy support. And more and more as and when the technology becomes more and more available and gets cheaper, I think the uh, floating view market is going to have a very good potential in Southeast Asia, especially. With that, uh, I come to the conclusion of my um, presentation and I have to tell that with, with S&P Global, your decision means, means progress. Um, if you need more and more information, more detailed information, me reach out to our company and we will do our best to help you and support you in your investments moving forward. Thank you so much. I'll be taking up more questions later in panel discussion and feel free to get in touch with me as well. Thank you. Thank you so much sir, for the insightful presentation. It was a pleasure to have you. Now, uh, uh, just a quick reminder for the polls. I've already got many votes, but let me remind you again. So some of the poll question is, what is the most important factor when choosing solar inverter brand? We have got uh, a few options. The next is, uh, which of the following solar energy features are the most important to you? And the last one is, where are you from Southeast Asia? So... Let us know in the section your answers and looking forward to it. So now moving ahead, I would like to call upon screen Mr. Suchun from 
Goodby Southeast Asia for the presentation on Goodby Solution CNI Storage plus AFCI Utility Solution. Welcome on the screen, sir. The screen is all yours. Thank you, Priyashi. I hope uh, you can. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. It's perfectly visible. Okay. So thank you, Priyashi, uh, and thank you, Solar Copter, for giving us a great opportunity to present our solutions to our fellow panelists as well as uh, all the audience. Welcome for taking your time out to join us today. So basically, uh, I'm Ng Ng Siu Chun. So I'm actually the country sales manager of Malaysia. And at the same time, I'm also taking care of the technical sales uh, for, for the Southeast Asia region. So today, uh, my presentation will be break into two parts, basically. So the first part, we will be focusing more on the CNI storage solutions that we will be able to provide as a one-stop solution provider for all the CNI, uh, CNI installation. The next part, I will focus more on the utility skills uh, solutions. So without further ado, I will jump into my presentation. So these are basically the demands of, for the commercial industrial um, inst storage installation uh, in, in Southeast Asia regions. First of all, it, it will be like maximize the self-consumption. So you by putting adding in energy storage system, you are able to maximize your self-consumption from the generation from the PV system. Secondly, would be more on the, um, uh, I mean, maximum demand reduction. As we all know, with um, the latest uh, EV charging network that is uh, rapidly building in, in the region as well. Uh, so there will be a lot of issues on um, overloading or capacities uh, restriction on the transformer side. So this, this will cause a lot of issues for suitable site selection and so on. So with our storage solutions, we are able to help to mitigate this and, and make the site selection more easier. And also for uh, in the region, we have a lot of remote islands where access to access to power grid would be difficult at the moment. Uh, most of them are using um, diesel diesel generator. So our storage solutions also support backup function as well as uh, off grid functions. So uh, first, uh, firstly, this would be the maximized self consumption application. So as you can see on on the pictures uh, at the bottom left. We can charge the battery with the excess power of PV during the uh, middle day, and then discharge the battery during 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 the night time or during the earlier morning. Yeah. So basically, you can support the load operation for the full day, or even sell back to the grid when during the peak hour. Next one would be the application of time of use. So in Goodwe Solutions, we integrate four time periods can be set to charge the battery at off peak and discharge it during the peak period. So by using the time of use applications, there is also, we can also not only store the excess power, especially when uh, we are not allowed to uh, export it into the grid and also discharge it during the peak hour. Yeah. Then the next part would be the peak load shaving uh, module. So this algorithm is also integrated in our storage system. So basically what we would do is clients could, um, could set the maximum demand threshold via the APP. And then once uh, the incoming power purchase from the grid hits or exceeded this uh, pre-configured threshold, then our in our battery system will automatically discharge the power to compensate or to reduce the maximum demand from the grid. So by by that we are able to control the maximum demand uh, surcharge that that will be charged by the grid. Also at the same time we by installing our battery energy storage system, we are able to mitigate also the congestion in the network. So by doing this, clients would have more flexibility during the site selection and they also can um, reduce the 
initial capex uh, for their projects as well. Last but not least, um, also backup mode. Um, so besides uh, during grid operation, our battery energy storage system are able to also support backup, backup function during power outage. So most of our backup function, uh, we are very proud to announce that uh, we, we are able to do UPS level switching. So that means during power outage, our battery system will be able to switch into backup mode in, in 10 milliseconds. So as you can see, we can charge our batteries during the, the peak hour or during excess power and even have a capacity reserve in our batteries uh, when, when during out, outage, it is able to discharge and support the local loads. So we were able to have a 24-7 power supply, even during grid backup. So this is how it looks like during the power outage. And also uh, for assisting customers who have installed PV by installing our hybrid inverter uh, or battery energy storage system, we are able to um, do uh, capacity expansion uh, capacity expansion uh, for for the site. So as we all know, since the since the Russian Ukraine war, energy costs have rise a lot, and it also hit the region very uh, quite tough because uh, basically, if I'm not mistaken, Malaysia, countries like Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore have experienced a uh, huge increment in in the electricity tariff. So it also makes sense for some of the clients to expand their current um, PV installation capacity. Mr. Su was uh, presenting to show you that our uh, storage solution can help you with the time of use uh, in, in the day. For example, if um, there's some peak time during the day and the electricity price at that time is very expensive, you can set the, the time accordingly so that the battery can discharge uh, the energy during that time to reduce the uh, the amount of power used from you take from the grid, uh, which will help you to save a lot of money uh, from buying electricity from the grid. And next up, uh, our energy storage, of course, can help you with the peak shaving um, similar to the time of use that the peak saving mode can uh, detect power uh, at grid connection, connection point and uh, you can set the parameter to a certain number. Once the power exceeds that number, uh, the storage system will uh, start to discharge uh, automatically um, from the battery and reduce the power purchase from the grid. And uh, in part of the infrastructure investment, uh, as you all know, if we have uh, a lot of power sources in check into the grid at the same time, the grid might get um, a little bit crowded, let's just say that, and uh, can be bottlenecked in the network. Um, so to, in order to reduce that kind of problem, the storage system can charge at the off-peak hours and discharge to serve uh, the loads uh, at the peak hours. So uh, it can reduce the problem of the um, bottleneck in the grid. And uh, of course, it can help you to back up for critical power. And in backup mode, the battery will reserve power for emergency use. And especially if your factory or your house has very important lots that need to be um, to be stay on all of the time. For example, the security system or the fire fight system, which need to be powered at all time and cannot be uh, disrupted. Uh, when the power is off, then the battery will be uh, discharged and continue to serve this load and uh, help you to retain it at all time. Yes. 
and this is capacity expansion. This is um, one of the very best solution from Goodway. Actually, if you already have the uh, existing grid connected PV system, and uh, you don't want to waste your your old system, but need to add an extra uh, storage system to your grid, then could we have a perfect solution for you? Uh, you can use the AC coupling system and add just one more hybrid a AC coupling to your PV system. And uh, of course, uh, go together with that AC coupling hybrid will be the battery, which will help you uh, store the the, the exit um, energy without having to um, remove the old on-grid PV inverter. This is some of our C CNI storage solutions for your reference. Um, this is the combination of our new uh, hybrid inverters, the ET series from 15 to 30 kilowatt and our lithium battery links F for the outdoor solution. This is applicable for large residential and small commercial. For this, you can expand the backup uh, capacity of the battery up to 16.4 uh, kilowatt hour. And uh, this is another option for residential and small CNI, and uh, it will be available in Q3 2023. This is also applicable for outdoor, which include the uh, the cabinet will include the ET uh, hybrid inverters and the lithium battery. This also for ET 50 kilowatt and 100 kilowatt hour uh, lithium battery will be available in Q3 2023. This is our CNI solution for energy storage, uh, which is DC couple solution uh, for 50 kilowatt ETC or BTC hybrid inverter together with the lithium battery of Link C 100 kilowatt hour and the capacity can go up to 468 kilowatt hour. This is another application which can go way up to 936 kilowatt hour. This is our container solution uh, with the 25th and 45th solution, uh, which is uh, which has both the inverter and battery uh, and for the 45th, it can go up to 2,496 kilowatt hour battery capacity. Let's go to our utility scale for the string inverters. So this is our overall solution. Um, for good we utility overall solution, we will have uh, 1,500 volt inverters together with the MV station and our data locker uh, SCU3000. Uh, for this overall solution, you can see um, that the, uh, the MV station is the combination of the transformer, the MV switch and the L LV switch, which can be connected to the step up substation with the power cable less than 100 uh, meter. And we can connect up to three MV stations at the same time. This is our communication solution with the SCU3000. Um, the uh, Goodwee string inverters, 350 kilowatt and 250 kilowatt can be connected to uh, to the SCU3000 via the Mockbox uh, RTU and IEC103. And uh, this is also um, connected to the weather station, cleaning robot or check-in system uh, with Mockbox <coughs> TCP. And you can uh, see more when we uh, see more detail when we share with you the, this slide. I would like to introduce our newest uh, 
hybrid inverter, sorry, uh, our newest string inverter for the utility solution, well, which capacity go up to 350 kilowatt hour with, uh, with 50 to uh, 12 MPPTs and 50 or 20 ampere per string. And the inverter is um, has a DC input current of uh, 15 ampere or up to 20 ampere per string. We have reactive power compensation. Uh, this inverter can support 400 uh, millimeter diameter uh, AC cable, and we have Type 2 SPD integrated. Uh, we have um, faster communication and the uh, European efficiency of this inverter go up to 98.8%. And uh, this inverter have IP66 overall protection and C5 for option. And for PID functions, we have two functions that can coexist at the same time, which is uh, PID recovery and anti PID. These functions are optional and you can choose one, you can choose one or two at the same time. Our new products compatible with 182 and 210 millimeter PV uh, model. For 182 mm model, uh, the string, the, the, the input current of each string can go up to 14 ampere. And for 210 mm model, it can go up to 80.5 ampere uh, per string or 20 uh, ampere per string if it is by phase -off. And this is uh, one of the highlight feature of this product. It has intelligent DC switch and uh, it has fearless design, uh, intelligent break and art uh, extinction directly controlled by DSP. Like I said before, PID function are optionals and it, uh, and this product had two PID function, one is PID recovery which uh, can operate at night time and the other is anti-PID which can operate at the daylight and two functions can coexist, it which can bring the whole system uh, capacity and efficiency go up a lot. This is the overall design of our MV station. Like I mentioned before, our MV station have the LV room transformer and the MV room. Uh, the design is a uh, large capacity, compact structure, convenient shipment, and comply with IEC 6076 and IEC 6022712. Uh, 200. And here are some highlights of the MV station. It can go up to 44.5 kilovolt, 7 kilovolt, double split or double secondary widen, CVC ring main unit, standard 25th container design, and so on. It also can withstand the wind load of 1,720 PA and working temperature from uh, negative 30 to 60 degrees Celsius. And this is our monitoring system called Solar OS. It has a digital operation and maintenance. It can help you view visualization and uh, EOH analyzer, equivalent operating hour. IV scan and diagnosis, customize report, one click upgrade. This is a function of IV scan and diagnosis. It can help you detect small crack on the panels, shadows on the panel and over open circuit. 
the key feature of the key feature of this is in, first intelligent. It helps you to um, to detect failure and uh, station or sub array inverter level diagnosis. Visualize the data. Help it easier for you to understand. It has high efficiency. It helps diagnose it by one click. Diagnostic time less than 10 minutes for 10 megawatt station and less than 30 minutes for 100 megawatt station. Here's some case reference. This is the overall solution in Malaysia using our HT 250 kilowatt. This is another PV station 4.4. Um, megawatt in China, also using our HT 250 kilowatt. This is uh, our 40 megawatt PV station in China, and uh, it also using our HT 250. Yes, we have a lot of uh, projects for the utility and thank you so much for joining us today i hope you have a great time so we'll move ahead with our next presentation by mr uh, kitpat uh, chelam kanjana from uh, trina solar asia specific and the presentation will be on competitive solutions and technical trends of pv module welcome on the screen sir all right hi thanks priyanshi so uh, let me share the screen. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, thanks. So first, thanks Solar Quarter for arranging today's session. And also thanks everyone for attending today's sessions. So uh, I'm Kitty Pat from Trina Solar. So I'm the pre-sale APEC manager. So I'm responsible for the, for the modules products and the technical inquiries for the module applications. So uh, today's topics, I will be discussing about the uh, competitive solutions of the technical trends and the uh, red lattice model technology for the PV models. So uh, here, this one is uh, the, the topic that we are going through today. So I go quickly through the introduction of Trina Solar, and then I describe the latest technology called Intact Technology and the advantages on, on using the latest technology of the modules and the innovative packagings and then some of the reference projects. So uh, let's start. So the first one. So as you can see here that uh, Trina Solar is founded in 1997. And then we were listed on the New York Stock Exchange in 2006. And then in 2014, Trina became the world's largest PV model supplier. And then in 2015, Trina built another factory in Thailand. And then 2016, we built another factory in Vietnam. So now uh, Trina has the factory in three countries, in China, Thailand, and Vietnam. And then a few years ago, 2018, uh, Trina have acquired a Spanish tracker company called Encrave. So right now, Trina produces the modules, PV modules, and also the tracker system as well. And then uh, for last year, 2022, we have already shipped it more than 100 gigawatt of modules already. So uh, as you can see here, this one, it shows the, the global office of the Trina. So we have several offices in, in several countries. And as mentioned, we have already shifted more than 100 gigawatts of modules already. And there is more than 23,000 employees. And uh, we have customer more than 150 countries all over the, the, the globe. So in terms of the models, so as a trainer, we have already break the world record since 2010, uh, 25 world records in terms of the, the PV cell efficiency and the models. So uh, as a trainer, we have done a lot of R&D and the research and development. And also we have 
uh, acquire the standards like the IEC, the UL, and also the TUV to ensure the quality and the reliability of the panels. And as you see here, this one is the overview of the new technology. So uh, Trina Solar, we are using what is called the 210 silicon wafer size and also the multi bus bar technology, as well as the non-destructive cutting and the innovative arrangement of, of the cells and also the high density interconnection as well. So all of this will help to improve the cell efficiency and the motor efficiency also. So we are uh, for the entire top con technology, our cell efficiency can go up to 25%. And also we have some of the advanced HJT technology. So the, the HJT technology, the cell efficiency can go 24.6 or above. And as you see here that uh, for Trina Solar, we also ranked it in the Bloomberg NEF for the PV modules and inverter bankability. So to ensure that the, the, the Trina module is reliable. And also we have been the top performer in the PVE out reliability scorecard as well. And also we, as a Trina, we have a dynamic teams of uh, local and the Singapore team to support all the, the modules, trackers, and the, the solution inquiries. And we have already project references in numerous countries. So uh, in terms of the, the latest technologies of 210 modules, so in 2021, uh, Trina have already produced the 50 gigawatts of module production capacity and 40 gigawatts plus of that is uh, 210 latest new series models. So as of now, the Trina is the number one largest for the 210 millimeter model production scale. And by using the, the latest technologies, you could save some of the projects equipment, such as the lowering the system cost, because it can save some of the cabling and as well as the mounting accessory also. So you can see that by, by using the latest technology, it can save some of the, the project total cost. So, and here, this slide, it shows the overview of the Trina Solar products. So you can see that uh, Trina Solar, it's categorized in, in uh, several categories. So we have the product ranging for the residential market and CNI market, and also the utility skills markets. So we have the various of products that will be suitable for the various scenarios, such as residential and the rooftop projects. So the, the smallest one that we have, it costs the Voltec S. The power can go up to 435 watts. So this one is more suitable for the residential market and then we also have the the next one is a 510 watts and after that it's a 580 watt modules so the 580 watt module it's is for the cni market and uh, for rooftop applications and then we have the 600 watt modules as well and also of course the the largest one that we have so far is the 21 series it's a uh, 670 watt modules. So this this largest modules, it's more suitable for the utility scale projects. And it can help to save some of the, the, the POS cost as well. And as mentioned here that the Trina modules, we have characteristic or the, the latest technology into the, the modules. So this one is the summary uh, as shown here. The first one is a 210 millimeter wafer size. So we are using the, the advanced wafer size 210. And we are also using uh, what is called a low open circuit voltage. So uh, by using the low open circuit voltage, you could connect more modules per string. And then you will have the, the less number of the strings which can reduce some of the cabling quantity as well. 
And the next one, we also have reinforced our structure frame. So as the modules tend to get bigger, we still keep the reliable of mechanical load performance. And also we have invented the integrated delivery solutions for the, for the what we call packaging. And we also using the non-destructive cutting to reduce the micro crack and increase the mechanical strength of the modules. And also there's a high density in the connections and the multi bus bar technology. So this technology can help to improve the model efficiency as well as the, the power output as well. So uh, the next slide, this one, it shows the, the latest technology called N-Type. So for the N-Type products, we have three types of products as shown here. So the first one is shown on the left. This one is a Vertex S N-Type. It can go up to the 445 watts modules. So this one is, is suitable for the residential market. And the second one, it is for the CNI or the rooftop market. It is a uh, 605 watt modules. So this, this one is for the, the rooftop applications. And the right one, of course, is the largest model that we have so far. It's a uh, 695 watts NEG 21s. So these are all the N type products that we have. And as you can see that for the, for the N type, the, the power class and the efficiency is higher than the P type because the, the cell efficiency is higher. So uh, if you take a look in terms of the, the 605 watt modules, you can see that the model efficiency can go up to the 22.4%. And also this model is a dual class by facial. So it can generate the power in the front and the back side also. And the next one, this one is the, the largest modules available in the market. So this one is a 695 watt modules and the module efficiency can go up to 22.4%. So this one can help to save some of the the mounting accessories as the number of the modules will be reduced for the same project site. And as mentioned earlier, Trina has also developed what it's called the innovative packaging. So for the 600 plus modules, uh, right now we have packaged into the, the vertical placements. So uh, you could see that the conventional packaging or the traditional packaging, it used to come in a horizontal stacking shown on the left hand side. So for, on the right hand side, it is a uh, innovative packaging. It's uh, what you call placements. So uh, the, the benefit for the innovative packaging is that it can fit more power into the containers. So you could see that uh, comparison here that uh, if you compare the, the conventional packaging, the 540 watts, the power per container, it's only 334 kilowatts. But for the, for the Trina 670 watt modules, the vertical packaging, the power can go up to the 373.8 kilowatts. So the power per container increased by 12%. So this can help to improve the, the transportation and the logistic cost as well. So it can help to save some of the, the transportation. And uh, in addition, uh, Trina Solar also have Trina Tracker system. So for the Trina Tracker, it can generate higher power with uh, the smart tracking control system. So this will help to lower the, the electricity cost per one hour compared to the traditional one. And also the Trina Tracker have already more than eight gigawatt of global installations already. And we have uh, five gigawatts of annual capacity already. And the next one, this one, it shows some of the applications for the Trina tracker system. So for Trina trackers, we have one portrait solutions and also two portrait solutions as well. So uh, we have various 
solutions to fit the numerous of the applications for the solar farm, solar floating, solar farm applications. And then uh, we are using what is called the super track algorithms. So this super track algorithm can help to improve the energy output and as well as forecasting the, the, the weather and some of the backtracking system as well. And we also have the SCADA system called the Trina Smart Car to help to analyze and collect all the O&M data. And also here it shows some of the summaries for the Trina IoT. So uh, Trina also have the, the IoT solutions for the for the industry. So it can collect all the data and can help to improve some of the OM management and as well as to optimize the operations. And as mentioned, uh, Trina factories we have in China and in Thailand and also in Vietnam. So in 2022, the production capacity is already 65 gigawatt for the modules and 50 gigawatt for the cell capacity. And here is some of the project references. So you can see that uh, Trina solar modules have already been applicable to various applications like solar farm, solar floatings, and the tracker system as well. So that will be all for today. So thanks. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. It was really to have your insights. Yes, we have some questions from you, for you. Uh, would you like to take it up? Should I display it on the screen? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, uh, actually, for the for the what you call packaging, uh, that's the assistance tools that Trina can provide. So uh, if if the installer use the the assistance tool for the what they call unpackaging, so it can help and assist to the to the unpackaging of the what they call solutions. Uh, maybe any one of you can take this question, uh, both of you, Mr. Siuchun and Mr. Kittipat. Uh, yeah, so uh, our battery, uh, basically this is a function on our PCS. So we do have a UPS level switching integrated. We have a transfer switch integrated into our PCS. So yeah, we do support a U UPS level switching. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one last question and then we'll move ahead with the panel discussion. Uh, okay, so regarding the distribution uh, in Philippines, it's best that uh, you drop us an email on that and we will discuss from there. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for uh, putting down the questions and thank you the panelists to, for answering it. So now uh, I would like to make a small announcement. Attendees can post their questions in the Q&A box and the panel speakers will answer the questions at the end. And uh, once again, a last reminder for the polls and be ready to get the exciting gifts as well. On the left side of your screen, you can see the poll option and you can uh, vote any time. So let us start with the exciting panel discussion, much awaited. And uh, allow me to reintroduce the elite panel for today. Mr. Frank Constant from Constant Energy, who is the moderator for today. Mr. Lorenzo Mancini from Total Energies. Mr. Wilson Zhang from Liz Energy Group, Mr. Kevin Hoare from NG Services Malaysia, and we have Mr. Dharmendra with us from SNP Global. I would request all the panelists to come up on screen and requesting Frank sir to lead the discussion ahead. Thank you, everyone. Frank sir, over to you.
Frank, sir, are you with us? Frank, sir, you're on mute. Okay. I am unable to unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, and on the below of the screen, uh, there's an option to unmute yourself. Yes. Sorry, sorry, everyone. No apologies. Problem. Thank you. Please take it ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fianchi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, I think this session we want to. Uh, I want to welcome the panelists. Uh, here we have uh, people from uh, uh, from the industry who have been very active in Southeast Asia, CNI uh, sector, solar, and also have uh, uh, also been active in trying to develop uh, solar projects and, and storage projects. Uh, because we'll talk about storage on this session in addition to solar CNI. Um, the uh, the um, uh, we have about. Uh, I think 45 minutes for this. So we'll, we'll first um, uh, we'll open up after 40 minutes to to um, a Q and A. Um, I will take some questions then. Um, the uh, I just introduce myself first. So I'm, I'm Frank Constant, as founder and CEO of Constant Energy. We are a CNI uh, platform in Southeast Asia. We have about uh, 20 Fortune 500 clients in Thailand. Vietnam and Malaysia, uh, we, and we basically own and operate uh, CNI solar plant, uh, large scale rooftop floating uh, solar plants, and uh, working on these three markets for now. Uh, um, the uh, perhaps the first, um, and I, I will go to each of our panelists uh, uh, with us today. We have Kevin Lorenzo, and, and we have uh, some. Uh, um, People from the finance, Darmindra from from SNP also joining us, uh, um, and the you will see that the uh, um, we have Wilson from Lis Energy. So people who have been in the business for a while on CNI and I think some 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 uh, detailed deep view on 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 certain markets uh, where they are particularly experts. Um, so it'll be very interesting. Maybe I'll start with the first question. I think what's a hot topic right now is, I think for all clients is the, uh, in Southeast Asia, all our industrial clients is the increase in power prices. You know, uh, Malaysia just increased their power price by 40% in January, uh, giving a bit of a shock to a lot of the industrial clients. Uh, Thailand has increased uh, through four increase about in the last 12 months by 50% its power price to industries, 50% five zero. Um, uh, Vietnam is, has not increased yet. It's still at the same level uh, for the last uh, year and a half. Um, Indonesia is still also quite low. Um, Singapore has increased a long time ago, about a year and a half ago, started to increase significantly power prices. Uh, uh, and Philippines also has increased. Uh, uh, but those two markets, Singapore and Philippines, are, are more, uh, I would say, unregulated, and therefore increasing price happen more quickly than than regulated market. Um, so the first question, and I'll I'll, I'll go around first to uh, uh, to Lorenzo, and maybe after that Wilson and Kevin, uh, and and um, uh, would be around uh, uh, the question of Have you seen this increase in power prices create a change in behavior from your clients, from your prospects? in terms of adopting solar uh, faster. Maybe we start with you, Lorenzo, and then and, and go around the, uh, the, the panel. <clears throat> OK, thank you, Frank. Yes. Briefly. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, thank you, Frank. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Lorenzo. I'm Italian. I'm in Singapore. I've been here for 15 years now. I'm in charge of sales for Southeast Asia for Total Energies. Uh, Total Energies is a big uh, company, energy company, traditionally. I am, we are active in the distributed generation segment. So we do rooftop, uh, um, ground mounted, floating solar systems and energy storage system for corporates across Southeast Asia. We are active in 10 countries. So Southeast Asia plus India and Japan. And um, yeah, it's a great sector to be. To come to your question, uh, Frank, 
Yes, definitely. I think, um, like you mentioned, in several countries, electricity prices have already gone up. The ones which haven't, namely Indonesia, it's only a matter of time because uh, in Indonesia, especially the grid price is artificially low. It's lower than the generation cost and the PLN is being subsidized by the government to the tune of three or four billion dollars every year. This is unsustainable. The only reason that it keeps going on is because of politics. So it's probably going to drag on until next April 2024 when there's going to be a presidential election, but then it's going to skyrocket. In fact, the uh, domestic uh, retail price for residentials in Indonesia has already increased. The only reason that the, the corporate rate for customers hasn't is, is political. The consumers or the, the corporates, yes, they see the benefit now more than ever, I think, because uh, um, obviously what we offer hasn't really changed in price uh, in terms of what our proposal is a long-term contract with a fixed or floating rate. But if the benchmark that we are referencing against has increased, the advantages are much bigger. I'll stop here because I don't want to take up everyone else's time. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, thank you for this insight. Maybe uh, um, a feedback from you on this question, Wilson? Uh, yes, thank you, Frank. Uh, so I'm Wilson from LYS Energy. LYS Energy is part of Leader Energy, which uh, in the power business, so we are in renewable energy, solar, hydro uh, in seven countries. So what Lorenzo mentioned is, is quite true. Uh, a lot of energy markets uh, have, uh, have some low prices at the moment, but we do see energy prices being uh, and in, uh, that it's going to increase, especially in Singapore, when there is a tight uh, energy supply issue, we, the market price went up very quickly. Now, with that, a lot of customers in Singapore uh, have immediately started looking for solar energy, right? And which means that solar energy will grow quite quickly. We also expect it to grow quite quickly in a uh, open, open um, in any markets with clear regulation. So, but Wilson, uh, sorry, just to to interrupt you, Wilson. Singapore, from what I hear from EPC, they have so much work on solar on site. Everybody is asking for solar on site solutions. So, does that? But while well, before, you know, it would take a year to convince the client to sign. Now it's like they have to sign within three months. Otherwise, you have you no. Know, it, it's it's too late, and and you know, people there are so many demand on solar installation that there's no time to waste with clients will take a year so do you see that as well do you do you see a, a, a do you have to say are you in a position to say no to clients because you're too busy or, or not yet uh that, that is true uh, there is a few main factors that cause the rush and it's very hard to decline the client because uh you know this energy demand is increasing and solar is one of the things that we could do in Singapore. But there is also coupled with um, labor issues, safety issues. You know, we have a very strict safety regime in Singapore, a lot of new rules in place, uh, fire safety and stuff like that. So it's very hard to decline the customer and definitely the customer really wants to have the solar on the roof within the next two, three months. Uh, this is what all the customers say. Uh, so it's very hard to, to balance out the current demand uh, and the labor force that we have in Singapore to execute all these projects. But, uh, you know, customers are, uh, well, at this moment, the energy price is coming down, so the market is a bit more tame. Uh, but in general, I think what you mentioned, it's true. The market is, uh, is moving very quickly in the last, last year, 2022. 2023, we see a demand being very quite high as well. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Kevin, if you can introduce yourself and, and let us know the impact of these power prices on your business. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Kevin. I head up business development for the Malaysian business unit where I look at things like renewables and energy efficiency as well. So covering utilities as a service within our portfolio within the Malaysian office. Uh, just like what you said, Frank, uh, customers are very demanding right now with the 40% increase. Customers want solar up immediately. But I guess one of the very interesting challenges in the Malaysian business is 
are can they wait or are they willing to wait for approvals for the tax incentives so this is a zero capex versus you know uh, putting their own money into solar systems which which is better which one gives them a better total cost of ownership uh, in essence so th these are some of the very interesting challenges customer outright customers outright contractors have seen seen a boom in the business in january and this is probably going to continue in the next quarter which is very encouraging um, the government also recently announced more quota for net metering as well as uh, ground mounted uh, solar so that's a very good thing in, in malaysia right now good thank you thank you kevin um is there a, a, a Malaysia, since you're, you're a specialist on Malaysian uh, sector, the, you know, Malaysian CNA has been very quiet. I mean, only like uh, 80 or 100 megawatts were built. The, do I remember that conference we did two years ago, same conference. And at that time, only 100 megawatts Malaysia, while Thailand and Vietnam were building like over 400 megawatts a year. Uh, have you seen an improvement or an increase of the velocity of the new installation in Malaysia in the last 12 months? And yes, can you quantify uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we're definitely seeing a huge increase. The So in the Malaysian business, uh, the first person who knows if the industry is busy uh, is actually the grid consultants. So we know that it's huge. Uh, they have been so busy. Unfortunately, a little hard to quantify. Uh, the ticker on the quarter applications hasn't dropped yet because all these applications are just going in and, you know, uh, you'll see it soon. <laughs> Kevin, thank you very much. Very interesting. As yourself and 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 uh, uh, it's your thought on on the on the market. Uh, Frank, I think we are losing your voice. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Frank, are you able to hear us? Yeah, I, I can hear you loud and Okay, now we can clear. hear you. Please continue. Okay, so I just wanted to invite uh, Damindra to share his thought on introduce himself first and then maybe share his thought on this increase in power prices and the business of CNI. Sure, thanks, Frank. Uh, I, as I mentioned during my presentation, I'm Dharmendra Kumar from SP Global. I look into the rooftop solar market in South Asia and rest of Asia as well. And uh, we produce market reports, global market reports, solar market reports in, um, and we let our, our customers, our investors know that wherein they can invest at what particular time. Coming back to your question on to the high electricity pricing, I, I think this is, this is something which is bound to happen and we kind of knew it already. However, some of the markets which has already done the early adoption of rooftop solar or even ground mount solar for them i think it was it will not be a surprise however with the current market pricing and the commodity prices going high i i think this is sort of a boon for the solar market at the moment wherein the electricity can be sold at half the price of the regular uh, retail electri electricity pricing only thing is that, that uh, some of the markets which are already opened and uh, people have seen the benefit out of it there in not much of education needed. However, markets which are still opening up, I think they're in the rooftop solar market will be growing and uh, long term PPAs will be helping much, much better, especially the CNS sector. Residential market is going to be still slower in Southeast Asia because of the subsidized electricity. And I would also think that People are not ready yet to do the investments in terms of residential rooftop unless the government comes with a subsidy scheme or better policy. However, net metering is uh, literally helping. Maybe some of the markets are not providing grid connectivity and also not um, providing uh, net metering in real sense. However, um, offsetting the actual extra electricity produced. So that way, I think the market is going to be a little bit, um, I say, uh, some of the markets wherein the net metering policies are very easy to adopt, 
I think those markets will see more and more rooftop installations taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damindra. Thank you very much. Um, the um, now this, uh, this let's move on now maybe to the second uh, theme of these panels, which is uh, about CNI and storage. Um, and I would uh, probably go to to Lorenzo and uh, to our friend from uh, um, uh, Wilson from Lis um, about their. Uh, you know the, the 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 experience they will be able to share existing very many people talk about battery storage very few people have done it um and we are lucky enough on this panel to have people who actually have done storage uh, in their in the southeast asian markets and have operating assets um one of the challenge with storage is the regulatory framework often is is complex or inexistent uh, to deploy this storage and be able to um you know, uh, in, make them investable from an infrastructure investor point of view. Uh, you know, the, the one of the markets that, that, that started to try to do storage in a big way was the UK back uh, five, six years ago. And, uh, you know, they, they devised a, a system with about six or seven different revenue streams. Um, uh, one, so one of them was capacity payment for 10 years. Another one was some rapid... Uh, response payments, which was market-based, not not fixed price. So you had like a sandwich, or let's call it a millefeuille. Uh, I'm French, so I will use a, a, a French pastry uh, comparison. So it was a millefeuille of revenues, uh, and you know basically there was a, the longest revenue term was 10 years, the capacity payment. All the other were floating, market-based, not fixed, and typically three to five years. So very difficult when you're in the power business infrastructure to to invest long-term capital with short-term revenue sources, not only short-term, but also variable sources. So uh, not surprising that it took about four years for the first large-scale batteries to deploy in, in the UK. And it's really only now that you know Brexit has happened and UK finds itself short of power um, for various reasons that the battery market has shot up in the UK in the last two years. Um, Similarly, in Southeast Asia, we did not have really a uh, great, uh, you know, much regula regulation on batteries. In fact, Japan, which was very hot on solar, uh, uh, you know, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, mandatory announced that four years ago that they will not allow solar plants to have battery storage. Um, I guess the utilities wanted to keep that business for themselves. Um, and as a result, very little development of battery in, in Japan from a private investor point of view. Um, until recently, uh, they just overturned that, discuss, that, uh, discuss, that, uh, that decision about uh, a year ago or in the last few months. Uh, other markets and, and uh, have also not really been providing regulatory uh, framework for battery in Southeast Asia, apart from a few. Um, um, Thailand has just provided a tender. We can talk about that if you're interested a little bit later. But um, more to the one who actually have done it here in Southeast Asia, I'll, I'll, I would ask, ask to ask uh, Lorenzo uh, from Total DG and Wilson from Lis Energy to, to share their experience on how they build, develop this, their battery storage in, in that they actually are, are operating now in Southeast Asia. Maybe over to you first, Lorenzo. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think the, the biggest uh, um, difference or the biggest thing that we need to um, separate is uh, energy storage uh, off-grid or energy storage on-grid. You know? We have done some off-grid systems, which is basically a PV system plus energy storage plus diesel generator as a backup, not connected to the grid, so an island, a microgrid. That's relatively straightforward both to, to design, to implement, and to, to contract, and it also commercially. I mean, we are, in that case, displacing electricity generated by diesel. So the cost average is 23 to 24 US cents per kilowatt hour. We can easily do better than that with solar plus energy storage. No? But that's a limited scope, not limited in the sense that there's not a potential for a huge amount of them. There is, because Indonesia or Philippines, which have tens of thousands of islands, that's the the most uh, efficient way of electrifying them. The different thing is uh, um, energy storage connected to the grid. So on grid, like you said, I think uh, the 
the I'm not French, so I won't say me for you, but the revenue stacking model is, is quite uh, still the thing, basically. Our subsidiary, uh, Sun um, Power in the States, is, is doing a lot of these projects uh, because uh, where the regulations allow, there is a potential for implementing solar together with storage, both to, uh, let's say, charge the battery during the day and then discharge it during the night but also to do arbitrage on the different cost of electricity between day and night. This is something that in some countries in Southeast Asia is very close to becoming economically feasible. Uh, Singapore or Vietnam, for example, are two examples. The issue is a bit like you said, that there is a very big component of, of merchant risk or merchant exposure there, because it's although the, the, the spread between the day, daytime tariff and the nighttime tariff is big enough to, to uh, justify arbitrage, neither is fixed, is market driven and market settled. So this makes it difficult to, to, to implement a long-term solution like an energy storage on a PPA basis. Over to you. Thank, Thank you, you Lorenzo. Um, yeah, so at LYS Energy, uh, we are Oh, all right. Sorry. So at LYS Energy, of course, uh, we are very focused in the CNI business um, for solar rooftops. Uh, the battery storage serves as an enabler for, for many things. Like Lorenzo has mentioned, this revenue stacking is a critical um, decision or discussion that we have. How do we make the revenue to cover the investment of this battery energy storage? So. Uh, from Goodwe earlier, uh, they have also mentioned that you know there are many things like reduce peak demand, uh, yeah, shifting of uh, load shifting, and so on. So these are also important things for the markets that we're looking in, where curtailment has become an important issue. When the system could pr produce a performance ratio of like 85 percent, but with curtailment, uh, the en utilizable energy has dropped to like 70 percent. So this energy storage can shift uh, and provide uh, additional revenue. Uh, in our experience in the CN market, uh, we are using it a lot for the containment uh, topics that I've mentioned briefly, as well as, for example, in Cambodia, there is a capacity charge. Uh, in Indonesia, there is a 15% capacity. So there's a lot of limitations on your PV inverter capacity. So with that, you know, the battery enables uh, uh, increased utilization of the very low cost of energy from solar. All right, so I think regulation is uh, one important aspect, uh, but in terms of market case, uh, CNI market, definitely storage has, has become uh, uh, easy and uh, it's a, um, commercially viable option uh, as long as the revenue stacks uh, correctly for the business case. All right. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Wilson. Maybe a follow-up question on this. You both had the chance to do this project in Cambodia with battery storage. What were the kind of uh, um, um, you know, uh, challenges that you faced there? Or, or, or you know, what was a nice surprise and some of the things to improve you think from or unexpected parts of the of the process of installing these batteries and and running them. Even so, I, we understand it's it's off grid. Well, uh, so go ahead. Yeah. So you may proceed. Sorry. No, no, Wilson, go ahead. I I'll speak after you. Go, go ahead, Wilson. Oh. Sure. Thank you. Well, uh, the battery storage itself has a complexity with the battery management system. Now, you know, having the right control mechanism, the, uh, the complete solution, uh, it's quite important. That is one. Uh, also, in different markets, the support level of uh, equipment suppliers may be different. So integrating and putting it together uh, requires some engineering and, and, and commissioning wise. Uh, apart from that, I think any good uh, integrator is, uh, should be able to put the pieces together, but operating it uh, is a different 
level compared to just a solar plant. Uh, uh, I think in a few other sessions with Solar Quarter, we will also speak about digital twin operation platforms and stuff like that. So that becomes an important component of the energy storage system. Thank you, Wilson. That's Over to you, Aaron. Yeah, um, I would like to add just that um, what we have found for experience is that what's critical is having a very clear understanding of what is the load profile of the customer and that load profile being um, consistent over time because you need to size the PV system accordingly and the energy storage system accordingly. The energy storage system particularly is expensive in itself, so you don't want to oversize it, but on the other hand, you cannot make it too small. Um, in our specific case, the first project we did was a water bottling plant, the Kulara Water, which is uh, the number one uh, bottled bottle water uh, company in Cambodia. And uh, uh, that's good because it's more or less a, a consistent consumption process that they have. So you can more or less uh, um, be very precise in the sizing of the solar and uh, the storage. Like I mentioned, the first project with them has been in operation for nearly two years now. And just recently we started construction on a second one on a separate site on the same concept. So um, a lot of work needs to be done, I think, in preparation to understand exactly what is the expected uh, load profile of the customer. That's critical. After that, yeah, the technicals of it, both PV and energy storage, frankly speaking, are not really rocket science. The management of the system itself is a bit tricky, but the construction is not a big deal. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um... The, that's a great in, um, sharing on, on your experience on, on that you have actually done it on these uh, off-grid systems. Uh, perhaps moving still on battery, but moving to the on-grid uh, projects now, which are uh, uh, potentially coming in, in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, I would start maybe do a review of the different of the countries and, and what they've done. Uh, I would start with Thailand, where I'm sitting today. Uh, so in Thailand, um, there's, I would say, two two things to watch. First of all, in December, we had the first, the COD of 133 megawatt hour grid connected battery storage uh, by a, a local uh, Thai developer. Uh, that's connected with, a, I think, 20 megawatt solar plant. And this is feeding into the PEA system, feeding into the grid. Uh, now the regular, the, you know, you can install, regulatory wise, you can install battery. It's not an issue in Thailand. Um, uh, the, and this particular project, uh, as far as I understand, was part of a, a tender for a firm renewable power that took place five years ago. I think there was about 200 megawatt AC of, of project approved. May, most of them were biomass because there was a requirement to stay 16 hour flat by the, on the grid. Uh, and I think this project was essentially designed to do that with a solar plant. So they had to, to have a, a very large amount of storage um, built. Um, and this project basically get, is getting a, a price, a, a, fit, a, a, a price, fixed price per kilowatt hour um, for every kilowatt hour produced out of that of that plant, basically. So that's the first one. Uh, and again, it's COD. It's fairly large, 130 megawatt hour storage. Uh, then the other one on Thailand that I would I would uh, mention is a program that's called Big Lot. Uh, it's essentially uh, uh, started uh, four months ago. The regulator has launched a tender for uh, it's it's not a it's it's basically like a LSS without the price component. The price is given, so it's not a reverse auction. It's a it's a Where uh, is everyone able to hear Frank, sir? Uh, it's under our program B I G L O T, and uh, under that program, there. <coughs> The uh, Frank, Frank, we are losing your voice. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, as to who are the uh, um, 
uh, lucky uh, selected. Uh, projects. And those projects will be 10 megawatt plus. So probably 10 to 50, 60 megawatt uh, DC uh, solar with battery storage. Uh, we are not able to hear you, Francis. We talk about we talked about Cambodia volunteer. Talk about Malaysia. But do you want to do the honors? Francis, we are not able to hear you. We are losing your voice. Yeah. Hi, Kevin. Can you hear us? Yeah. Now, now I can hear you. Okay. Okay, Kevin. You want to talk about Malaysian battery? Uh, Rams. Yes. Yeah, oh. uh, sure. Uh, unfortunately, in, in the Malaysian context, there there aren't too many battery projects. Um, the government is trying to encourage battery use via the uh, or, or the ongoing uh, virtual power purchase programs um, that we have. Um, it is suggested in the guidelines uh, for developers to try to install batteries, although that's not mandatory. Uh, within the government roadmaps itself, uh, there there might be plans to put on uh, batteries into the grid, but it's still not very clear how the the schemes will be implemented. But there could be a potential of five hundred megawatts there for it. Um, but that's all I have on the batteries, though. Um, so it's not too not not too active uh, in the uh, part of the business in the Malaysian context. Perhaps, uh, what about, uh, Kevin, what about the GPP? I understand there is a, a strong uh, in, uh, um, suggestion by the regulator to install battery together with this um, solar. Uh, um. Uh, yes, uh, there is a very strong Offside. push. To PA projects. Yes, there's a very strong push for it. Um, however, given the mechanism as, as to how the scheme could work, it is highly unlikely that um, you can secure a corporate off taker who would be willing to pay for the differential uh, in the long run or even in the short run um, for the batteries. So yep. it's very likely that all submissions that go in to, uh, in, in the current uh, opening, uh, quota opening, will not consist, uh, will not have batteries planned in the development i see understood thank you i think another market where there's been actually a deployment of battery large scale on grid is singapore uh, perhaps wilson you can share with us what uh, what's happening yeah. yeah thank you frank so uh, recently in Singapore, there is a 200 megawatt battery system that was commissioned in, uh, in Jurong Island. Uh, it was, um, we don't have too much details on the commercial operation model, but it is, uh, appears to be for grid support uh, services. So stabilization and uh, frequency response and stuff like that. So. So we are seeing a lot of uh, large-scale solar, uh, large-scale battery systems coming to the market, uh, and it'll be quite interesting to follow this year and next year to see the development of such requirements on regulatory as well as uh, commercial viable projects like that. Okay. Thank you, Wilson. My connection wasn't so great. I, I didn't. Uh, so, would you like to add something uh, uh, on? I know in, in, in Philippines, Total has been very active uh, for some time. Is there a, is there uh, an opportunity? Um, You're breaking off, but Frank. Um, I'm not sure I heard the question, but uh, um, in, journey, in, in general, in terms of storage, I think, uh, apart from um, Singapore, which Wilson already mentioned, 
Um, I think that for on-grid, probably it's either going to be project just generally across Southeast Asia, which are uh, commissioned and driven by the utilities, a bit like the Singapore one, you know, for uh, grid stabilization uh, and uh, um, in intermittency management as uh, the uh, quantity of solar is, uh, is increased. Um, I'm not sure how much space there is going to be for um, behind the meter energy storage corporate solutions. Um, I think it, potentially there's going to be some opportunities for, like we mentioned before, revenue stacking, thanks to arbitrage, thanks to demand uh, um, mitigation, so basically peak shaving or uh, solar displacement from the day to the night time. I think also it could be um, useful if the utility, the government, the regulator at one point decides to make uh, storage compulsory in the sense that this was something which was ventilated, was discussed and was part of uh, the uh, one of the draft of the regulation in Vietnam a couple of years ago. Now it's apparently resurfacing again since the uh, the grid is facing a lot of problems due to the intermittency, which is caused by solar systems, distributed solar systems, so rooftop or small ground mounted system across the grid. Um, it would make sense if the regulator imposed uh, to install a small energy storage system together with the solar PV system um, to mitigate the first 10 or 15 minutes of, uh, of fluctuation. So basically, reduce the amount of uh, intermittency which is transmitted to the grid, clean up the signal. This would have a limited cost impact and would probably uh, incentivize the energy storage market across several countries in Southeast Asia. Um, I think it's something that we're probably going to see come up again because uh, mm, the main excuse that the grids uh, are using now to discourage or to uh, let's say deter or slow down um, DG solar rooftop installations is uh, the impact on the grid. This would solve the impact on the grid and would help the energy storage market. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I, can you hear me now? Yep, better? yep, I can. Yes, yeah. better. We have a question. Lorenzo, I, 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 Obviously, Total has been quite active in the Philippine market, CNI. Do you see, a, a, um, in particular in Philippines, whether there's an um, um, opportunity for deployment of uh, battery storage grid connected going forward? Any regulations that you think will be conducive to that? Well, you know, exactly. The regulation is changing now in the Philippines quite quickly. And they are uh, quickly making things possible which were not until a short time ago. So definitely energy storage is also one of them, one of those on the cards. Um, I think it will depend very much on what is the, the, the benchmark grid price that we reference against, which in the Philippines is extremely complicated, as you know, because in the end, the, the market, electricity market not being transparent, you don't really know what is the price that the customer is paying. So it's difficult to uh, determine if uh, an, an energy storage installation would be uh, cost competitive for him. I think it's, it's, definitely opening and this is one of the things that would be make it useful on the other hand philippines being uh, several thousands of islands a lot of which are not grid connected it's a huge potential market for off-grid systems so microgrids which are pv plus batteries plus dg for backup thank you thank you lorenzo very interesting um let's hear it from damindra from the finance and rating point of view where with your um, global eyes on, on on the benefit of batteries. What do you see for us in Southeast Asia coming up from a financial and market point of view? Oh, well, battery storage is at the moment very important for Southeast Asia, I would say. However, uh, there are also some pros and cons. The, uh, the pros of having battery storage having with your rooftop installations or with your um, ground mount installation is that you will be able to provide uninterrupted power supply even at night time and then you can also avoid the issue of curtailment which we have been seeing in the market already we have been hearing lots of rooftop electricity being curtailed because the grid is not ready to take your electricity and then uh, because of that, so much electricity is being wasted already in 
in a market like Vietnam, we have seen 9 to 10 gigawatt of installations there. But because of curtailment, the electricity is going for a waste. So battery storage would be one of the best thing to do there. At the same time, there are a lot of industries at the moment who are running on DG power. So uh, it's like uh, diesel generators, which are by the evening, the moment your solar electricity is gone, they start their uh, diesel generators. I think this is something wherein the developers uh, can always focus on. They can replace the diesel generators with battery storage, wherein the electricity which has been generated in the daytime can still be provided by the evening. So what is it that is stopping the market? I believe that the high cost, which is at the moment very important, is what inhibiting the market from growing. So the battery storage, if the prices goes down, you will be seeing more and more battery storage projects also coming up in Southeast Asia. Because it's only um, the cost thing which is going to, which is avoiding grid connected battery storage systems in South Asia. So uh, if the cost goes down, we will be seeing more and more projects with storage coming up in future as well. And as every other panelist said that there is a high potential for storage market in Southeast Asia and we'll be looking forward to it in upcoming years. Interesting. Thank yeah, you. It, can I add one thing to this? Yeah, I agree. And But I think there's also one other aspect which is interesting is that um, the manufacturers of the cells for energy storage are not really actively looking at new markets. The uh, demand which is coming from the EV market is so huge at this moment that energy storage is to some extent pushed aside. The, the lead time that we get for energy storage system is incredibly long. It's easily 12 months, no? I don't know what you see the meaning about that. I mean, for me, it is. I don't think that there is an active uh, uh, scope seeking. I mean, the energy storage companies are not really, we. Total Energies owns the SAFT, which is one also of the energy storage companies. They do huge systems and they have a pipeline which is full until 2025. So um, they're not really interested if we go along and say, okay, we have an opportunity to have a megawatt, one megawatt here. Okay, get in line and just wait. You know? I agree with you because I think even Malaysia at the moment is looking at storage business, but not into solar, rather in electric vehicles. So, But again, if you look at from the other side that if electric vehicles itself has started manufacturing and the prices still goes down for battery, then there are again chances for solar to adopt battery storage. Yeah. No, thank you, Damindra. I think it's also interesting. We, you know, we, we, I think we, we I bought for, our, um, I bought some battery storage for our Puerto Rico plants, you know, where 70 megawatt we build solar in Puerto Rico and you had to have battery storage there. So, I bought from SAFT, like you mentioned SAFT, uh, Lorenzo. I bought from SAFT seven years ago, like four or five megawatt hour of battery for those projects. And uh, I think I paid $1.3 million per megawatt hour at the time. Uh, I think six, five years later, the price was down to $300,000 for the same equipment. Yeah. Uh, that was two years ago. And uh, and now it's gone back to like 400 uh, back up, you know, with the automotive demand. But I hear that, you know, in the last six, seven weeks, a lot of news around uh, maybe, you know, showing drop in, in, in uh, commodity price, like cobalt is at, I think, at a three-year low. Uh, so there's some, you know, good news in terms of uh, um, uh, raw material price drop uh, that are used for battery recently. So I think it's, uh, we may see uh, the, the normal trajectory of, of, uh, of uh, batteries, prices going down again uh, soon uh, as uh, manufacturer increase have been increasing capacity dramatically even so demands increase i agree and also i think what's interesting is that um we are looking or we are anticipating that probably maybe not now but in two or three years time there's going to be a big wave of second life batteries coming from evs which will come on the market for redeployment for example for energy storage you know because um, the, the batteries which are used for EVs are very uh, stressed. I mean, the operation is, is very, very challenging and they need to be 100% or 90% uh, capacity and performance. While for an energy storage solution, maybe you can oversize, but even a second life battery is, is a perfectly good solution. And um, I think there's going to be a flood of that offer 
on the market, which is immediately available, which is tested, works perfectly well, and has a price which is a fraction of uh, the new batteries, which will probably kickstart the market uh, in a big way. Thank, thank you, Lorenzo. Any further comments on battery that uh, before maybe we open the floor for Q&A or any other uh, general uh, thought from our panelists? Okay, maybe we'll, uh, we'll open the, um, the floor for Q&A. Uh, Priyanshi, maybe you can assist there um, on, on, uh, on questions from, uh, from the audience. Thank you so much for the wonderful session. I would request all the speakers to kindly answer some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, you can check uh, which are the relevant questions and answer it uh, in the Q&A box itself. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the questions are more of a technical nature, so maybe are more suitable for the, um, for the other panelists. But there is one uh, which is what are the financial benefits of solar energy? What are the environmental and benefits of solar energy? Um, this is interesting, I think it's very general, but what we do and what normally is the advantage that solar energy does is that it replaces or displaces energy, which is typically generated by fossil fuels. Um, amongst all, all countries in Southeast Asia, some more, some less, the traditional electricity is produced with fossil fuels, with gas, with coal, with oil, and so on. So if that's replaced with solar energy, obviously that's a big benefit for the environment in terms of decarbonizing the supply of energy. Um, that's in terms of the environmental benefits. Then the economical benefits are that now it's possible to install solar systems which have a life expectancy of 20, 25, 30 years, which means that the cost per kilowatt hour generated is actually cheaper than the cost of electricity which is sourced from the grid. So it is a, a double benefit for the customer because there is the environmental aspect with a, a, a basically a decrease in electricity price, especially now that, like we said at the beginning, the electricity price is going up across Southeast Asia. Okay. Another question, which is also maybe okay. Now I leave this one. This is more technical, not for me. This is yeah, some of uh, the may, maybe maybe I yeah. 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 maybe I can take this one. Uh, this is Ng from from Goodby. So on the communication of the PMS to the BMS and activation of BL, are we able to achieve near instant switch over without interruptions of power? Okay. So basically, uh, I assume that our the questions will be more on when there is power outage is, are we able to to switch over for for the battery energy storage system without any uh breakdown in the power supply uh for from our good B side uh all our hybrid inverter or storage inverters are integrated with uh, ups level switching that means we are able to switch over in case of any power outage within 10 milliseconds so you probably will will experience some flickering in your lights but uh, that's all that you will do so basically the battery will kick in before you you, you have a total power failure and everything is already integrated in our system i hope this answers the questions thank you so much so we'll take one more question and we can wrap up the session Hmm. What is feed-in tariff? This is interesting, I think. Um, feed-in tariff is a mechanism that is present in uh, several countries whereby the grid company, the utility company, which uh, supplies the electricity, will uh, pay for the electricity which is generated on site and injected into the grid. Typically, a rooftop system, for example, will generate electricity on the roof for the factory underneath during the week, but it will generate also on Sundays when the factory is not operating, that energy goes lost unless there is a feed-in tariff mechanism in place, which means that the grid will take it and pay for it. It's an incentive which the grid operator provides to um, encourage the deployment of solar systems across the country. Okay. Uh, Kevin, sir, would you like to add upon this, since this question is uh, specifically for Malaysia? 
we would like to hear from you i believe uh, kevin sir is not with us no problem that uh, answered our question so with this we'll come to the end of to the event uh, a very big thanks to for all our esteemed speaker for the wonderful session we will now uh, be ending the session thank you audience and panelists so a very special thanks to mr frank for superbly managing the special and a big shout out to our attendees for extending your time and support to the event a special thanks to our partner goodwe for extending their immense support to organize the event we promise to come back with many such exciting sessions a last reminder for taking participating in the polls winners will be getting their gift voucher shortly the floor is open for netro thank you that's all for today thank you thank you thank you everyone take care thank you bye bye thank you goodbye thank you thank you bye bye Thank you everyone goodbye